Hey everyone, I'm Eamon Elswa and this is Getting Into InfoSec. Our guest today is Marcus Carey. I've always been a tinkerer. I built stuff. I was a science fair geek the whole nine. Marcus is the CEO and founder of ThreatCare and has spent over 20 years in incident response penetration testing and forensics with a variety of federal agencies, including the NSA. And so one of our analysts went rogue and tried to hack back. He's really passionate about giving back to the community through things like mentorship, hackathons, and speaking. Marcus really breaks it down for us on how to learn to learn. So now I'm like a finely tuned weapon when it comes to learning and doing things like that. Marcus has mentored a lot of people and shares with us a breakdown of how to get past the job interview. It should be impossible for anybody to do bad on an interview. And the reason why I'm telling you this, the two parts of your interview are things that an employer says that they need for the position. Give yourself a couple of weeks. Usually jobs, these type of jobs that break into security from a SOC analyst or whatever, those are evergreen positions that they're always looking for. You should have seen me while I was recording the interview. Marcus was dropping tips like candy from the sky, and I was just blown away. Really happy to have met him. I even left in the part where he corrected me, as I thought it was important for you to hear. This week in getting into InfoSec news, I found a couple links. One is Azaria Labs and how she talks about the paradox of choice, which is really true. You have so much information out there and uh, you kind of get overwhelmed. Definitely recommend checking out her article. She has really good articles on just the topic of just focusing and and getting stuff done. The next one is cyberseek.org and they have this interactive pathway that shows all the different feeder jobs that would feed into information security. I really like it. Definitely check it out on a desktop. It doesn't come out that well on your phone. Check out the site. Very interesting resource. Thanks, Input, for sending that. All right, on to the show. Hey, Marcus, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be a part of this. Great, yeah, same here. So let's start from the beginning. How did you get into information security? Well, when I was young, um, I think the thing that I saw when I was young was stuff that I kind of like nerdy stuff that kind of like attracted me, like, you know, Revenge of the Nerds or War Games. I kind of understood I was a nerd from day one. So war games really got me into wanting to get into computers. And there was definitely a security element to war games from a hacking perspective. And anything related to hacking and all that stuff, I kind of wanted to do that since I was a kid, probably. Nice. But I guess, like, I didn't have the resources to do it, though. So the military was a good start for me because I joined the military at 18. Even though I took basic programming in school and I took Pascal programming language, But that was the only thing that only exposure to computers I had. I didn't have my own PC or anything. So the military, when I joined the military when I was 18, I got access to a lot of stuff. So that's where I really started my computer security career, I guess, in the military. So entering the military really helped you kind of springboard your information security itch. Can you talk more about that and how that helped? Yeah. So uh, when I was 18 years old, actually, I was an avid basketball player back in the day. Most people wouldn't believe this, but I actually had a chance to go to college to play basketball. But what happened was it wasn't a full ride, so I would have to pay. And I was dirt poor growing up, so I couldn't afford anything that wasn't full ride. So I couldn't get a full ride. So one day when I was walking around high school campus, there was a Navy recruiter that was recruiting people for the Navy, and it said that it paid for college. And so since it said it was paying for my college, I was like, okay, cool, I'm down for this. And then so I, I joined the military so it would pay for college. And then since I scored pretty good on what you call an ASVAB test, it's the Armed Forces Aptitude Test. Mm-hmm. That test, I scored pretty dang high on, and they told me I could do nuclear engineering or cryptography. I ended up going into the cryptography field, and this was 1993. And why did you choose cryptography? I told them I, I just wanted to work computers. Okay. That's all I wanted to do. Nice. Okay. So having, having said that, uh, they say, yeah, it was computers and communications and stuff, because most of the stuff that we did was classified. So even my recruiter didn't kind of know what the heck I was getting into, but he understood there was computers and stuff involved. And so luckily, that was the biggest thing that ever happened to me as far as getting on, because during the military, there's tons and tons of, you know, billions of dollars spent on computers and stuff. And so once I got in, it was just a golden ticket to mess around computers, computers everywhere, the labs, even in the barracks, you know. Global telecommunication systems. We had the first Cisco routers. We had everything, like everything you could imagine that was related to networking and communications and security and cryptography, like ridiculous cryptography. But this was like government cryptography systems, you know, stuff that wasn't even available to the public till like kind of like some of these things are just being available to the public now. Right. I've been working with since 1993. Right. 
So okay, and were you breaking things before you got in the military? Breaking things? I mean, I've always been a tinkerer. I built stuff. I was a science fair geek the whole nine. So, like I said, I had learned how to program a little bit in school uh, growing up. I was in gifted and talented classes, and they let you play around with computers and stuff back in the day. And I learned how to program in basic. But other than that, I was always a math and physics tinker out building stuff and doing the science fairs. You know, so yeah, definitely a bit of an artistic person. I wanted to be an architect when I was growing up. So I've always kind of like been a builder and breaker of things. So the Navy was obviously a big springboard for your InfoSec career. But tell me a little bit about your pre-Navy days. What was the mindset you were in? Did you know you wanted to do information security or you just know you wanted to do computers? And can you tell us about a time where you possibly were in, quote unquote, hack a situation, a situation where you were stuck, you had to come up with a, a solution and it could have been a technical solution or just, you know, a hack in your younger days? Like when I was young, the people that I looked up to, my mom at some point bought a used set of encyclopedias. And so I was like totally into all the sciences and stuff. And so the people I used to look up to were inventors like Thomas Edison, Benjamin Franklin, just name it like, you know, Leonardo da Vinci. Like all these different people were my people that I looked up to and I wanted to be like. So I used to tinker around and do tons and tons of like science experiments. I was really artistic, so I could draw. I won statewide drawing competitions. I placed high at science for us because I was good at my hands making like volcanoes and whatever that there may be. So just tinkering. And like I was the poorest person I knew growing up, bro. Like I didn't have any money. Oh. So anything I did was a hack. If I made my own hacky sack, funny enough, because I couldn't afford it, I used to make my own toys. I made my own like track pit because during the 90, the 84 Olympics, I was into like, I want to be a long jumper. So I made my own track. We used to live in the country. So I made a jump pit like up the specs. Wow. Amazing. I found a basketball rim <laughs> and made my own. I found a rim and ended up making my own basketball court. Like I just would find scrap parts and just build stuff. So, I mean, ever since I can remember, I was always building whether it was technical or non-technical. You know, plus learning how to program. Like I said, I learned how to program basic when I was like, must have been like eight years old and just making computer programs back then. And then in high school, I took Pascal. Man, I just, I've always been a tinkerer, man. I've always been fascinated with building stuff. At least I love MacGyver. You probably remember that TV show. Oh, yeah. Where that was my whole thing. And that continues to this day. I mean, I, I started a software company and I'm still building and tinkering around and figuring out stuff in the computer world now. but. Didn't have a lot of technology at my disposal, but when I would tear stuff apart, you know, whether it be lights or electronics or whatever, build that kind of stuff too. I was always building and tinkering stuff since I was young. And so I've always been fascinated with that kind of stuff. So it kind of all points to, you know, kind of like being in a field where you can break and all that stuff. And I guess in the military, the military taught me the security aspect and gave me mad exposure to computers. That's amazing. Yeah, there's definitely something to be said about that. That's great. And I want to dig into your artistic side. I'm finding a lot of quote unquote hackers, a lot of security folks have this really huge creative side to them, whether they be musicians, artists or anything like that. You know, do you have any comments on that? Yes, I can remember me being like five years old and drawing and having paper, like manila paper, and recreating the things I saw in books. I can remember clear as day, like drawing Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And then, like, when we would have competitions in school, there was this, like, thrift store or something like that. It was kind of like a Walmart before Walmart called Ben Franklin down in the south. I drew this portrait of Benjamin Franklin pitching Benjamin Franklin chain. And it won a competition. There was also some kind of centennial of the Constitution. When I was young, I drew Thomas Jefferson hand writing the Constitution. Like it was like, and hands are hard to draw. I just had a talent for drawing. So that's when I knew that I was like, I was artistic and all that stuff. Um, my mom, my church actually put me through piano class. And when I was young, man, I must have been like nine, ten. I went through piano class, so I learned how to play the piano. And then in sixth grade or seventh grade, I went to play band and I never had played the trumpet before. But based on being able to read music really well playing the piano, I was first chair in six weeks of that. Nice. So that was a musical related thing as well. So I think that being able to create stuff and, and where there's nothing there, I think that transfer well into code for sure because there's nothing there. 
and you have to create it from scratch. And that's the same case with drawing and same case with music. Mm -hmm. And you talk a lot about you have to learn how to learn, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, can you expand on that right now on how it relates now in information security or getting in? Yeah, totally. So every person has some kind of core foundation already, no matter what you did when you were growing up. I think like learning how to learn. So I know, and I'll give myself an example. I'm an auditory learner. I learn by listening to somebody and also a visual learner. If I see somebody do something, I can recreate it. So that those are two things that I know that I learn from. So what I do and everything that I do, I learn in those manners. For instance, like there's this thing called sub-vocalization. Sub-vocalization is when you read something, you kind of read it. Internally, you have this inner voice that you're reading something with. So what that does is that makes you read slow, though, right? Because you're pronouncing every word even in your head. Oh. If you ever study like speed reading, some people speed read to read stuff. Mm-hmm. Speed reading, you have to eliminate sub-vocalization. Basically, you take the information in without reading it and just let your brain just kind of take it in. So I figured out I'm a slow reader because I tried to learn speed reading. But what I know is I do sub-vocalization. And the reason why I do sub-vocalization is that means when you read Mary Has a Little Lamb, even if you don't read it out loud, you read it to yourself in your brain. So you'd be like, Mary Had a Little Lamb, right? So how that works is with your mind, you have to read it way slower. But in my mind, I'm vocalizing it to myself because I'm an auditory learner, right? So I read super slow, but I take it all in. Mm. And so that's something that I know about myself. And also, since that's a skill that I have, I can listen to audiobooks and retain at a high level because I'm an auditory learner. So to me, I can listen to audiobooks and I can learn a lot. So when I say you have to learn how to learn, what I'm talking about is that everybody learns a different way. What you have to do is you have to figure out how you learn, and then you're going to be able to take in more information faster, whatever way it may be. Because you can't learn how Marcus learns because everybody's wired different. Right. So if I say, hey, man, some good audio book, blah, 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 that might not be your thing, right? Mm-hmm. It may be a CBT, a computer-based training course, right? And, you know, there's stuff like Cyberry. There's stuff like all these different blog posts. So everybody learns in a different way. Learn Python the hard way, right? Like doing it, you know, the hard way, for example, by hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and again, if you're a kind of learner that you learn by doing some people say i learn it by doing or you can learn by seeing somebody else do it if i see somebody do something i can recreate that yeah right that's how i am so what you have to do is you have to position your learning around how you learn best and there's a lot of different ways to do that and then maybe like doing python like how do you learn python well some cbts will give you a sample of code and then ask you to do it maybe that's your way or maybe you could just watch somebody on YouTube doing Python. If you're a visual learner, you can learn well from that. So my thing is nobody can tell you how to learn as good as yourself. So what you have to do is you have to take note. I didn't know anything about self-vocalization, so I tried to learn to speed read, right? Because my whole thing is how do I learn best? How do I take in more information faster? And so that's what kind of like guided me down this path. So now I'm like a finely tuned weapon. When it comes to learning and doing things like that, because I know exactly how to learn. I know I need to get, I can get an audio source, like audio book or whatever. I know that I can go to YouTube and watch somebody do something. And then all of a sudden, snap, I got another skill. And that's how I learn. That's nice. That makes sense? Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, I never really heard sub-vocalization as a term before, but I, you know, I've always, I guess, internalized it. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of the same way. If it's a regular book, like say, I don't know, a Malcolm Gladwell book or whatever, I could listen to an audio But if it's a technical book, I find it difficult in audio and I kind of need to read the words, right? So I've learned that myself, but it took me some time to figure that out. But eventually I got that. I say, yeah, that's that's really good. Also, there's one more thing I can add on to that. Absolutely. Another trick that you do is like, even if it's a technical book, I can tell you the book that I'm going through right now that's quite technical. Mm -hmm. And this is related to information security. So there's this book called How to Measure Anything in Cybersecurity Risk. It's a cybersecurity focused version of How to Measure Anything. Yeah, I'm reading that right now too. (laughs) <laughs> cool. So what I do is I get the audiobook, right? So for all the background stuff, you can just listen to. But from the technical content, there's some I got the audiobook and I have the freaking physical book. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, so there's tons and tons of stuff that is background informational that can be conveyed word of mouth. This is like old school 
you know, this is what, funny enough, this whole word of mouth thing is how humans first started to become, you know, smart. Right. And pass along the information. Mm-hmm. And so that's why when you go to a conference, that's why everybody's, like, from a travel perspective, that's why everybody's in the halls talking. Because that's how we do it, right? Right. Absolutely. But this book, right, How to Measure Anything. So what I do is I listen to all the, like, background information. And then when they zero in on formulas and math, that's when you need to actually look at it and do it. Yeah. So it's kind of a hybrid approach. And that's how I consume stuff uh, so fast. It's like, okay, cool. I know that I can listen to all this stuff. If they're talking about theory, I can take that in. And then when it comes to math and the formulas and equations and stuff and anything they cite, then I'll just go look up. That's actually real, real good stuff. But I'll tell you how good I am at this. And this is not bragging or anything, but this is how good I am at learning stuff. Mm-hmm. So back in the Navy, there was these things called CLEP tests. Okay. And a CLEP test is a test that you can take for college credit. Now, most colleges have these tests, but sometimes they don't tell you that you can take these tests. So in the military, these tests are free. And so these tests could be over history, science, whatever, right? And so if you go to college and you want to test out of a class, if you did test out of class, you probably took a CLEP test. Hmm. Put it like that. So what people don't know is there's hundreds of these tests. These tests cost about 100 bucks, and you just go take the test, and it's worth college credit. Oh, wow. Right? Most colleges take 30 to 60, and this is important, too, because anybody out there that did a lot of credits, they can actually finish their degree by taking these tests that I'm talking about now, and that actually can help them break into security. If a degree is required, and oh, snap, I did all this college, so if I didn't finish, look at CLEP test, C-L-E-P. So what I did is I did over 115 credits on CLEPs. So that's 115 credits. That's a college degree, pretty much, by me reading and digesting information and then going to take a college-level test for it. And they were all free because I was in the military. So I see. I see. So these club tests are open to the public? Anybody could take them? 100%. Okay. There's this other thing called DSST. Okay. And there's a thing called Excelsior College Examinations. So those three things, anybody can take them, but nobody has heard of them before. And there's a lot of people that went to college for two years but didn't get their degree conferred or whatever. But you can still go back and do that if that's something that you need to do. I see this a lot, and I help people a lot, you know, get them on that path. But here's the deal. How did I learn those subjects? This is the most important part. So how did I learn those things is because there's these information sheets that come with all these tests, and the information sheets tell you what to study. So I could go to the library based on the information sheet and read what it wants me to read. Okay. I mean, what I need to learn, right? And then I would just go take the test. And these tests even tell you the percentage breakdown on the actual test. So it would say 50% this, 20% this, 10% this. Wow. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to study the 50% that matters. Yeah. And I'm going to know that's not whole. And as far as security goes, like, okay, cool. I did that. I took those tests. It should be impossible for anybody to do bad on an interview. And the reason why I'm telling you this, the two parts of an interview are things that an employer says that they need for the position. Mm -hmm. That's one part. Mm -hmm. And those are recs on a website somewhere. It tells you what you need to know. Right. Now, I would not pay attention to the, don't pay attention to years, experience, and all that stuff. What you pay attention to is the stuff that they saying that they need you to do when you get onto that job. All right, so cool. I need to know that stuff. I need to be able to speak to that. So I would say, look at those recs. Understand what's going on in the rec. I would say, Give yourself a couple of weeks. Usually jobs, these type of jobs that break into security from a SOC analyst or whatever, those are evergreen positions that they're always looking for, right? Get the rec, understand everything on the rec, play around with technology related to the rec. So if they say intrusion detection analyst or intrusion detection, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go download Snort and I want to play with Snort and I want to do every Snort tutorial I see. If they say something like packet analysis, I'm going to download Wireshark. And I want to get everything. I want to know everything about Wireshark. I want to be able to do custom snort rules to make it do IPS stuff. Right. I'm going to download Bro. I'm going to do Terracotta. I'm going to do like whatever. All that stuff's free. And it's telling you what they're expecting on the rec, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one part of the interview. Know what they want. The second piece is this. Your resume should be tight as a mug. And you should be able to tell everything on your resume. Like, I've interviewed people before, and they didn't know anything that was on the resume. (laughs) 
Like, I'm like, what the frick? Like, you know, like, okay, you did this. You have this on your resume. Can you tell me about that? And then they like, they're clueless about the tech on their resume. There's no excuse for that. Yeah. So what I tell people to do is this. Look at the rec. Tailor your resume to the rec. Reverse engineer the resume. My teacher told me one of the most powerful things ever when I was growing up. She said, like, hey, to answer a question, take the question and make that into the answer. And nine times out of ten, whoever grading your paper won't be able to tell the difference. And what I mean by that is this. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I'm saying, like, a question on background, like, definitely taking a test. You take whatever the facts are, because there's facts contained in the question. And then you make that question into an answer, and you add additional facts. You know what I'm saying? So if somebody says that they need intrusion, if somebody needs somebody from your IDS, and it has that language on the freaking rec, I would say something, 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 something. I would take the words, flip it around, and then I would make sure when I get into interview that I can speak to whatever that is. Right. Now, you don't have to really have experience on IDS. I mean, like real world experience. But you can say, have, have developed custom snort rules, custom whatever, whatever, right? You can say that on your resume. Yeah, find experience in your life that you can put on there, right? 100%. In a truthful manner, obviously. 100%. Because you don't have to be working those positions to get that knowledge, is what I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's fairly easy to see what the rec is, learn the stuff in the rec. That's exactly what I did when I took all those tests. I didn't know nothing about money and banking and what fiat currency was versus this kind of currency and gold back standard and all this crap was. I'm from the hood, man. I don't know none of this stuff, right? (laughs) So, But I went to the books and learned it, and then I was able to regurgitate it for the test. In the real world, Interview is the test, right? So it's easy to go get Wireshark and learn TCPIP upside down. You can take all these courses. You can take all this stuff. So you're not lying that you possess the knowledge. You're not going to say you did it for two years at such and such. You're going to say, I taught myself. Now, what's more impressive, me sitting in some other sock or some other crap or somebody that takes the motivation to go learn these things on their own, right? Yeah, having the self-initiative, right? Having the self-taught initiative. 100%. And so my superpower is my ability to learn and teach myself. So let me ask you then. So there's learning. Okay. But then you mentioned you took an aptitude test when you went to the Navy, right? And for getting into information security, there's a common understanding that we need the aptitude, right, for information security and also the spark, right? There's a talk about the spark and all that kind of stuff. So what would you say for folks that want to get in the field but don't know whether they have the aptitude to get in it or whether they have the spark, you know, how would they kind of formulate that or discover that on their own? Yeah. So I think aptitude allows people to learn stuff faster. And that's it. I think the military requires you to learn stuff fast because, you know, you go in and you have to learn stuff fast because you go into different duty stations and you have to learn stuff on the fly real fast. So the job that I did in the military required a high aptitude because I have to just learn fast. So you mentioned Malcolm Gladwell earlier. That book, Outliers, is it talks about if somebody practices long enough, it'll be impossible to see who's really talented versus who put in the hours of grinding. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. So I think if you're focusing on a narrow subset, like we're talking about, like I'm talking about, it's focusing on a, a specific set of skills that are kind of evergreen. Right. And if you work that long enough, it doesn't matter your aptitude, you can become an expert at that. And what people will, anybody that knows anything about that subject matter will say that this guy, this girl knows their stuff. That's what you have to focus on. Mm -hmm. You can't focus on everything because there's people out here that are celebrities and they act like they know everything. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Don't be one of those people. Focus on a narrow subset of stuff and master it. Right. Right. I would even say try to find the latest stuff. Like right now, you know, I think I tweeted about this. If you try to learn Kubernetes security or anything cutting edge, that could probably put you ahead of the pack, right? So be able to see what's coming down the pipeline and focus on that as well might give you an edge. What do you think about that? I agree. And so what I agree, and I agree on this kind of like on a partial level. Right. So what I think and what I know to be true is if you learn certain basic things, that's going to transfer throughout whatever, no matter what you do. So I would say if you learn Linux basics and how to harden a Linux system, that's going to apply to anything you're doing, whether it's Docker, whether it's Kubernetes, whether it's whatever. So you learn principles that are going to take that matter no matter what, Mm -hmm. IP chains, whatever. There's a whole bunch of stuff that relates to no matter what kind of thing you're doing. Oh, absolutely. 
internet working. Yeah. Like, just be good at that, right? And then learn the basics first. Biggest, so, yeah. And then you can be a beast incremental knowledge. Mm -hmm. So Kubernetes is incremental, Amazon, whatever, whatever. All that stuff's incremental knowledge. Right. But like have a really solid base if you want to be a security professional. That's well said. Yeah, that's how I kind of look at it. That's cool. You have a bunch of mentees from what I understand, right? Yep, yep. That you're working with? Yep. So can you tell me about what you're seeing, some common mistakes out there from your mentees that, you know, are probably happening out there at scale? Well, I think that a lot of the confidence is something that I help bring to the table. Mm. One of the things that I do is I kind of, I have to convince them that they're amazing. <laughs> yeah. And so that's what I try to do. Funny enough, what I see is I see I have women and men that I help. And a lot of times the women are like way more qualified than the men are. They got degrees, they got certifications. And they don't have the confidence sometimes. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You're, like, you're more qualified than I am. You know? <laughs> it's like, right. Like, what the heck? Yeah, the confidence is what I help people with a lot. One of the things that I've been helping people do is like negotiate salaries and get raises and all this stuff. And mm -hmm. it's just confidence that I help people out on, you know, being raised in a country like I was raised. I kind of approach stuff at a simple elementary level. And I think people overthink a lot of things. So I'll help them break it down and just have more confidence. I think that's what's missing a lot of times. Okay. Okay. And is there something for those listening out in the country or those in places with less resources, for example, or those that are people of color, anything like that, what would you recommend to them in leveling up? Yeah, I think that all around, kind of like what's funny about technology is that I think like being a person of color, because I'm black, so... I think that people need to know that there's other people I heard that have done stuff and are doing stuff. I also encourage more people that have been successful, whether it be women, people of color, or whatever, to reach back and try to help other people out and try to connect with them and help them out. I think that's the big part. I think that sometimes people think that there's scarcity of resources. And I think that that's the biggest myth going on in the world right now is how there's some kind of scarcity. We have more food than any time ever in the world. We have more medicine than any time in the world. We have all these different things, but if you listen to certain people, you think that there's some kind of scarcity of resources and all that. Where the truth is that we have an abundance of everything. There's jobs to go around. There's money to go around. There's everything there is. So what I would encourage people to do is to be more active and proactive on being a mentor. And so you don't have to wait till you make it to be a mentor and to help people out. That's the thing that I would say. And so no matter how successful you think you are, if you got a job and somebody else don't have a job, then that's an opportunity for you to mentor and help them get a job. Mm -hmm. You know, I've happened to, I have a company, start companies, or I'm helping people get jobs. I'm helping people negotiate their salaries. Like recently I had a guy get a 70K raise, help somebody else get like 15 more K than they were offering him. So you don't have to wait till you're a billionaire to make it. Right. You know, hopefully I'm a billionaire one day. <laughs> Incrementally, you can always be helping people. And so I think that's what's going to help us out ultimately. And have confidence. Have the confidence, people, no matter where you're at, you know, whether you're white, black, blue, whatever, you have the confidence that you got this. Because there's a lot of people out here that are faking in a photo out of bill, and they're out here doing it. So why can't you? That's right. You know, sometimes it has a counter effect where there's so much information out there. There's so much. And all we see are the superstars out there. And it kind of makes us feel small and we kind of lose confidence. We're overwhelmed by everything that's out there, you know. So just kind of taking a moment to step back and saying, okay, let's just take it step by step, step by step might be the way. Yeah, bro. That's our role. Everything is super simple. Even though stuff is complicated, break it down to a simple element. Look at the job right. Look at what the job that you want. That may be only asking you to do four things well. You may know two or three of them already. Get the fourth one down, rewrite your resume to look, reverse engineer the dang wreck, and go get that dang job. Mm -hmm. And negotiate for the hottest salary. Pro tip on negotiating salaries. Go to Glassdoor or some other thing. Whatever the highest salary is on there, that's what you ask for. People be asking for like like the bottom range or mm -hmm. somebody goes in, the HR tells you, oh, it's an 80K job. I'll go on Glassdoor. If Glassdoor says it's 115, that's what you ask for. Mm -hmm. It's like it, there's a book called Never Split the Difference on Negotiating. Everybody should check that out. Y'all tripping if y'all ask for or believe whatever HR said. 
Yeah. Don't do it. And never give out how much you're making also. Yep. What I would say too. California has a really good law on that now, but not the rest of the U.S. So. Yeah, that has nothing to do with you. You want to be paid commensurate to your current skill level. And this is what you think you're worth. I think I'm worth 115. Yeah, but it's only 80. Like if I kill it, my number's 115. Now, what's going to surprise you if you never did this for is they will come back with a dramatically higher number, typically. Or if they don't value you, why are you there in the first place? There is something to be said about that first security job where we can't really negotiate that much, right? I don't believe it, bro. Oh, yeah? No. Okay. No, I think people are hosing themselves, man. So, I mean, hopefully, if you listen to this podcast, my Twitter <laughs> is at Marcus J. Carey. Mm-hmm. Hit me up in my DM for advice if you're scared or... If you're uncertain or whatever the feeling may be, and I will help you negotiate your salary, like square business. That's awesome. That's great. So there's no such thing as that. So you're not getting paid because this is your first opportunity in the door. You're getting paid based on the value that you're bringing to the table, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I worked at NSA, man, a lot of the people that I worked with NSA were clueless, but they were making a lot of money. Mm. Now, it didn't matter if it was their first, second, third, fourth, fifth job, right? (laughs) They were clueless. Gotcha. Like 100%. Some people only had one job and it was like pushing a button or something. Wow. I'm not even exaggerating, bro. George Jetson, huh? I'm not exaggerating at all. (laughs) So what I would encourage y'all to do is you're way better than the people that are already working where you're at. Don't think that they know anything because when you get there, you're going to be surprised they're clueless. So, and this is just real talk. Yeah. I'm glad you're laying it out and that's what we're here for, right? Don't think that they know something more than you do. Because mm-hmm. you're going to get there. You're all motivated to learn and all this stuff. You're going to get there and like, oh, snap. Nobody cares. Right. But do not let them people out there make you feel less like you don't have to learn. Or you don't have to grind. Because what you're doing, you still the same thing. You're grinding. You're learning. You're improving. And then that's going to set you up for more opportunities. Let them be lazy and you grind. Because <laughs> you're going to figure this out real quick once you do get in the field. Okay. And now a message from our sponsor. Johnson, I need you to figure out the risk of this application ASAP. Do you have problems trying to assess the risk of an architecture? Having trouble deciding between red, yellow, and green? We have a solution for you. Introducing the Cybersecurity Magic 8-Ball. Ask it any question and simply shake the ball for an answer. We've incorporated the latest in AI and self-assessment research to make it foolproof. Even a five-year-old can assess risk with the Magic 8-Ball. Magic 8-Ball, how safe is the cloud? Better not tell you now. Magic 8-Ball, is my application secure? It is decidedly so. Cybersecurity Magic 8-Ball, is my application ready to go live? My sources say no. As you can see, the Magic 8-Ball is foolproof. Not responsible for any harm to your job or ridicule that may result. So let me switch topics for a second. Do you have any interesting war stories out there that you've run into? I'm sure you have a lot, but anything fun that you could share that from your days anywhere, really? Well, I'll say that I've built a lot of stuff. So one of the things I built, I built this thing called Threat Agent. This was a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And people still can't ask me. if I. So I built all kind of stuff. I built this thing called Honey Docs. I built a lot of stuff that other people have kind of like written tools like this before. I wrote tools that could kind of track people by doing like these little, I think they call them Honey Tokens now, but I came up with this thing I call Honey Docs. Okay. So basically, I had some people, they were like, you know, white hat hackers was using it to track people on Twitter. They would put these things in jihadi forums and they would track terrorists. And also, I got a contact at some point for some foreign police officers and they were using it to track people that were holding people for ransom, kidnapping and stuff. Oh, wow. So it blew my mind that whatever you do and if you write tools and all that, you never know who's going to use them for good or bad. Mm. And so what that made me learn is because a lot of people have this thing like, you know, white hats are writing all, you know, they're writing all these exploits and all that stuff. But it feels good to hear people when you hear from law enforcement that they're actually saving people's lives based on some of the stuff you wrote and you didn't intend for it to, you know, you write it for some other purpose. That's where you're a hacker, you write something, and then other hackers figure out different ways to leverage what you're writing. Nice. So never be surprised on how your work turns out to be used for good or bad. There's going to be bad people to use your stuff, but hopefully there's enough good people out there. You know, if you're you're actually saving people's lives and finding people that are kidnapping people, that actually blew my mind that 
much stuff was being used to do that. Well, there's our lesson to learn from that, I would say, is to share your work, right? I bet you a lot of people have some good tools they've written or whatever it is, but they haven't shared it online with the community. And that'll have a twofold effect, right? Someone as an employer could see that, but also have the second effect that you mentioned as well. What do you think? Yeah, 100%. Like if you're doing work out there, and this is another thing, thank you that you brought this up. So as you go throughout your, if you're looking for a job, one of the best ways you can do is to be able, again, take that job wreck and then demonstrate how you've mastered the subject matter related to that wreck by blogging or writing tools or whatever. Show externally that you've mastered those concepts in some way. Blogging is great, contributing to open source repos, maybe documenting open source stuff. And don't ever worry about somebody already put this information out there. Right? Do not worry about that at all. That's what a lot of people say. Oh, this is elementary, blah, blah, blah. And worrying about how people don't think they look dumb because they said that. You're always going to be an expert to somebody that's like not as advanced as you are right now in your career. You're going to help somebody out just by sharing that information. Now, just be, there could be 10 blogs on that same topic. You blog it, write it your way, put it in your voice, and I can guarantee you, you're going to reap the benefits out of sharing information. Uh, some people believe in karma or whatever. You put out good in the world, and there's going to be good to come back at you. So 100% share everything as much as you can, as much as you can do. Again, if that job titles intrusion detection person, blah, 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 you can put on your resume, like blog posts, boom, on IDS. Mm-hmm. So 100% share as much as you can. Yeah, yeah, I think I was in the same situation. I'm kind of was, am still, whatever you'd say, but... I haven't posted things that I've done, either simple things or elaborate scripts and tools that I've created. And now I'm trying to teach myself to do that, you know, more often. So for that simple reason, you know, oh, somebody probably did that already. Well, not really. So yeah, I'm glad you summarized it like that. So do you have any interesting stories from your, say, intrusion or incident response days or anything like that? Yeah, I got a quick story. Mm -hmm. So I was working at this one government place. We were doing SOC type work. And so one of our analysts went rogue and tried to hack back. Oh, wow. And he ended up hacking an oil company. Wow. So the oil company had compromised, and it was attacking one of the government agencies. But it was bad guys, of course, at the oil company. So then the government agency ends up looking like it's attacking the oil company, which was bad. Oh. So it was an international company. That was crazy. And that's a really nice, tidy war story. I can't name names or agencies, but that's it. <laughs> right. That's all you're getting from me. <laughs> right. Yeah. So will that fall under the insider threat category? Yeah, two things. So sometimes your employees are going to go rogue, and hopefully you can detect when they do. Mm-hmm. And also the hacking back story. Hacking back is talked about all the time. You can hack them back, blah, 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 and it's cool. But what the problem is, you might hack back the wrong person. So that's the two stories from that. Wow. Lessons learned. Thanks for sharing. So... You mentioned CLEP earlier. College degrees, certifications, all that is a controversial issue. What are your thoughts on that from what you found from your mentorship and everything that's out there? What would you say to that? Because it's not for everybody, but what are the two cents you can add for college and certifications? All right. So I think that college certifications, blogging, GitHub repos, all these different things can be used for proof that you know what you're talking about. One of my most successful mentor type situations is my oldest son. My oldest son is a senior software engineer for Rapid7. He did not go to college. Okay. And so since he's my son, he did grow up around me. He did grow up around computers. But his gift was being a software engineer Mm. and writing code. And so Rapid7 hired him when he was 16 years old. Mm -hmm. And he's been working for them for about six years. And he didn't go to college. He didn't have no certifications or nothing. No, but what he did have is he had tons of code. He wrote six iPhone apps. He had all kind of GitHub repos. He wrote a Metasploit API kind of thing for the iPhone back in the day nice. where you could run, you could export stuff from. Yeah, so he did a lot of cool stuff and he got hired. But what was his calling card? His calling card was he built all these apps. He wrote a couple of hacker apps for the iPhone and he had a ridiculous GitHub from all kind of stuff. Right. So. You have to be able to prove that you know what you're talking about in some kind of way. The interview could be a way to do that for an employer, but blogging, GitHub, certifications. It's a package, basically. 
Yeah, as much as you can do. Like, as much as you can do. You don't need one. But I'm, so I'll tell you, like, I'm black, of course. So what I thought growing up, everybody told me, if you're black, you have to get an education. Like, real talk. Like, Dr. Martin Luther King and all that stuff. Main thing they were fighting for is education mm-hmm. for black kids. Mm-hmm. And I grew up at a time frame where if you don't get education, you're not going to get hurt. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of like, that's the main thing where I got my education. I got a master's degree in network security. Do I think that you need a master's degree? I don't know. I don't think it hurts me. I don't think you need a master's degree. But I think, you know, being black, I need as many dang things as I can get. I can't even lie. Mm-hmm. Right. But if you're going to go into debt or, you know, if it's an extreme hardship for you, there might be other paths, right? Is that what you're saying? I don't think you need it. I do not think you need college, right? Yeah. I don't believe you need it. Mm-hmm. But I think it's different for certain people. Mm. I think it's different if you're black, 100%. Mm. I think if you're black, if you're a minority, I think you need as much stuff as you can get. I mean, that, that's the square business. Mm. So my son is biracial. But he had me. So, I mean, my son is like super privileged, right? So, I'm like, God dang. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, not to say I'm amazing or whatever, but, you know, his dad's well known. Yeah. He has access to computers. I, he knew how to code when he was freaking 11. Like, come on now. He's a mentor of mentors, right? So, <laughs> yeah. So, now what we do is we say, okay, cool. Any black kid out of the community, just up and be a cybersecurity pro, it would take a lot of stuff. People believe I'm awesome because I work the NSA. Mm. So I have privileges and stuff that made it so I'm here where I'm at. But me knowing NSA, I know that that is not a big deal. That's not a big deal to me. Like when I see people that work at the agency a lot of times, right? When they tell me they work at the agency, it doesn't mean anything to me. Mm. Interesting. Like if they, if they, I'm former CIA, okay, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> like, what does that really mean? That doesn't mean you know what you're talking about. So I want to encourage people. Everybody is unique. Everybody has to bring their own thing to the table. Bring you to the table. You're unique. You're amazing. Bring it to the table and let the chips fall where they may. Absolutely. That's great advice. So tell us about your company today and then what it does. Okay. So my company is called Threat Care. What we do is we help companies build, measure, and maintain our cybersecurity programs. Because if you look at it, funny enough, a lot of people are not doing really good at cybersecurity overall. Hmm. <laughs> and so we see this all the time. So what we do is we help people, you know, put a program in place and we help them test it, what, what we call breach and attack simulations. So we imitate hackers on networks so organizations can see if they can defend against it. So that's kind of like what we do in a nutshell. And what made you start it? I personally had a lot of frustration with the security industry as far as the vendors go. The vendors make a lot of stuff. They sell a lot of stuff, but at the end of the day, from a risk perspective, people risk is actually decreasing. And so what I want to do as a company is I want to be able to try to measure that. And like, and remember I tell you the book I'm reading, everybody should read that book, How to Measure Anything in Cybersecurity Risk. Mm-hmm. How do you really measure that? And how can you prove that you're secure? You put a firewall on your network. Oh, does that make you secure? You put an endpoint protection on system. Does that make you secure? So, you know, nobody knows. People are doing all this stuff, but they don't actually know if it's moving the needle as far as being secure. And so at our company, we help people test that out by doing breach and attack simulations. And from there, you can tell whether it's really working or not. That's good. And for someone getting into infrared security, is there a way they could use your product to learn? Or is it mostly just geared to enterprise folks? Yeah, 100%. You can go to threatcar.com and you can download our free tool and you can run breach and attack simulations. If you want, this would be a great way for you to use something like Wireshark, Snort, whatever. And you could actually try to see if you can detect the intrusions that we create. Okay, that's awesome. Well, Marcus, thank you for sharing today. I think you had some really good wisdom to share with everyone. And I look forward to talking in the future. All right, thank you very much for having me. All right, thank you. If you have any questions or comments about getting into InfoSec, you can reach me on Twitter at Coffee with Eamon. You can also reach me on LinkedIn or email me at amen at gettingintoinfosec.com. Want to stay in touch? Go ahead and subscribe to my email list at gettingintoinfosec.com. If you think any of these conversations would help someone else, then let them know. They might thank you for it. Intro music by Trash80, trash80.com. Every week I let my guests pick their music. This week it's Coop by Young Carts. See you next time.